I've converted my Prusa Mark III to a mainboard that's meant to be for an Ender 3 because these fly mainboards will give you RepRap firmware and Wi-Fi control for any 3D printer you like. I've been in the process of converting most of my 3D printers to have Wi-Fi connectivity, either with Marlin and Octoprint, Clipper firmware or RepRap firmware. On paper, one of my most dated printers is the Prusa Mark III, which still had the original 8-bit mainboard. So when presented with the chance to test out one of these Fly E3 mainboards, instead of putting it in the Ender 3, I targeted the Prusa Mark III. Let's check out the specs. What we're looking at today are two mainboards from Mellow, the Fly RRF E3, as well as the Pro Edition. These are both drop-in compatible boards for the Ender 3, which also means the original CR10 and the Ender 5. The non-pro version has bare sockets for installing whatever stepper motor drivers you want to use, whereas the pro version has TMC2209s integrated into the main board. The boards are quite similar, but as you might expect, the pro has some extra input-output ports, such as firmware-controlled PWM fans, where the standard model can support two, but the pro version can support four. The RRF in the title stands for RepRap Firmware. Previously, I've covered the LPC port of RepRap, installing it onto a Big Tree Tech SKR board, but that required me to make up extra components. The advantage of this new board is a more powerful processor and the Wi-Fi chip being integrated into the board for use with an external antenna. Combine that with the touchscreen that's designed to be used with RepRap firmware and we have a much more sophisticated product. In fact, this new hardware works so well that older LPC boards will no longer be supported in future versions of the firmware. The bare standard version retails for just under US $30, and if we include TMC 2209s, the price is $47. US The basic version of the Pro is only a couple of dollars more, and variations exist if you're using a thermocouple over a thermistor. Also in this video, you'll see the 4.3 inch touch LCD. If you don't buy it as part of a bundle, $45 for 4.3 inches, or $65 for a 7 inch version. This next bit's complicated. Jay from Team Gloomy originally sent me the non-pro version with TMC 2209s and the screen free of charge after agreeing to my review policy. And then I managed to kill the board, I think by not having a stepper motor driver inserted correctly. Jay was then kind enough to send me the pro version free of charge which had since been released and I thought it was fair that I pay for my own flyboard since I was the one who broke the original. You can see on Thingiverse that I actually started this video back in April and the print has been sitting around since then, so I thank Jay and Team Gloomy for their patience. So putting my slowness aside, what is it that makes these boards stand out? Well, there are plenty of drop-in Ender 3 mainboards available, but these boards, along with the Big Tree Tech RRF E3, are designed to run RepRap firmware, not Marlin, and provide the Duet web interface. Normally to run RepRap firmware, you need Duet hardware, which is beautifully engineered, but is expensive and very hard to source currently. Furthermore, this port of RepRap firmware is endorsed by the creator and even has a subsection assigned on the Duet forum. This board would be completely plug and play on an Ender 3, but that doesn't mean that I can't use it on another machine. So we'll head into installation and I'll point out how it would be on an Ender 3, as well as the extra steps I had to take to get it fitted to this machine. In my opinion, the very first thing you should do before any mainboard swap is to connect via USB, send M503, copy and paste that into a text file. This will save a lot of time later for things like steps per millimeter and probe offsets. That brings us onto the documentation from Team Gloomy, who are responsible for these non-duet hardware ports of RepRap firmware. This documentation is one of the real strengths of the product. If we navigate the side menu, we can find a lot of information on these specific boards. If you're following along and get stuck, it's an excellent idea to visit this page. There's also a specific page on installing this board in an Ender 3. Our first job is to prep an SD card and all of its contents are outlined on the Getting Started page. The first thing we need is firmware. We've got an STM32 board and we're using the onboard Wi-Fi, so we can follow the link. Scroll down to the release you want. I'm going to avoid the beta for now and come down to the stable, which is 3.3, and then download the binary. This is the first file to go on the SD card, and we need to rename it to simply firmware.bin. 
back to our instructions and the next heading down is SD card structure. And again, we have a link with further information. What we're gonna do at this stage is create the empty folders as listed. When we're done, we should have folders called macros, www, gcodes, sys, and firmware. The next heading down is Duet Web Control, and again, we follow the link. This will take us to a GitHub page where we expand the assets and download the Duet Web Control SD zip file. We now open the zip, open the www folder on the SD card, and extract all of the contents of the zip inside it. When that's done, the inside of www should look like this, and there's no need to unzip any of these files. The final parts of preparing the SD card are the configuration files for the printer and the board.txt file, both of which will be generated by the configurator. This interface is exactly the same as the vanilla Duet version, but catered for LPC and STM32 boards. Again, if we're using an Ender 3, our job is made very easy because there's a preset with almost everything exactly how you need it. In my case, however, I need to select custom configuration and proceed. For the most part, this system is very straightforward. We start by picking our main board. Here I'm setting up the Fly E3 Pro and naming the printer. And then from here, we simply fill out the numbers to match our particular machine. Remember that for some of these things, we have the values we needed saved when we outputted M503 from Marlin. If the printer is open source, you can get a lot more settings by looking at the configuration files online. Here's some settings of note. I highly recommend ticking read config override. That acts like the EEPROM in Marlin for easily storing settings. Your end stops will probably stay on the default. If you're using sensorless homing on X and Y or a probe to home Z, it doesn't matter what you put here anyway. I'm reusing the stock Mark III pin to probe, and I'm going to plug it into the E0 stop port. For the end stop configuration, here's where I've selected sensorless for X and Y, but as the warning states, we will need additional setup later on. I am using a probe to home Z, but until I select this down below, it won't be an option higher up. This screen relates to thermistors, and for the E3D thermistor fitted to the Mark III, I copied the settings from what I found searching in the Duet forum. On this screen, we set up the probing grid and my probe offset is 23. So I take 25 off the min and max for the X axis and I do a similar thing for Y. For the display, I tick the button for the fly touchscreen and I also tick the button for the networking. However, there's no point setting up the Wi-Fi name and password at this stage, so you should leave it blank. When we're finished with the configurator, we're gonna download our configuration bundle as a zip file. On the zip file, we have a sys folder and we're going to match that to the sys folder on the SD card and extract the contents. There's one more file that we need and it's the firmware for our Wi-Fi chip. We're going to click and download this, come into the firmware folder for our SD card and then copy it here. Again, shortening the name to just be duet Wi-Fi server.bin. The SD card can then be ejected and inserted into the main board ready for the first run. Generally, I find the online RepRap configurator gets you around 90% of the way. And don't worry, we'll get it to 100% later on. But for now, I want to cover the physical install. Let's start with jumpers on the board. And if you're using 2209s, you'll need to install the jumpers as per the instructions to activate the UART connection. For any axes using sensorless homing, you need to flip the dip switch on the underside of the driver and then you can carefully match up the pins and install the stepper motor drivers into the standard board. Obviously the Pro board already has the stepper motors integrated, so the only thing we need to do if we're using sensorless homing is to install jumpers on the diag pins for those axes. In my case, that's X and Y. If you've only got one Z axis stepper motor, install jumpers as shown in the instructions onto the unused pins. Finally, for either board, don't forget to install the heat sinks on top of the stepper motor drivers. On the Pro board, things are pretty tight and you'll need some funky angles for clearance. Time for wiring and the physical install. And if you're playing along in an Ender 3 as this board is intended for, it's simply a matter of unplugging everything and following the instructions from the Ender 3 conversion page to plug everything back into its correct position. For me, things are a lot, lot harder because I'm installing onto a Prusa Mark III, which has a claustrophobic electronics case and a mainboard with different connectors. Of great help to me was this SKR Mini E3 case that I found by Vivi09 on Prusa printers. It's got the same dimensions as the original Prusa Mark III case, mounts to the frame in the same way, and that means it's compatible with the existing lid. 
The key difference is that the mounting lugs and cutouts on the sides suit either of these two Fly E3 boards. That brings us to the original Prusa wiring loom, which uses Molex connectors, whereas the Fly boards use JST, just like other Chinese main boards, and that means they're incompatible. That left me with no choice but to cut off and crimp on all new pins to go into JST connectors, and for this many wires, that ended up being quite a job. Prusa also uses 5 volt fans, again incompatible with that buck converters, so I had to partially disassemble the machine to remove those and replace them with 24 volt versions. I took my time and referenced the Mark III assembly instructions. Eventually, all of my wiring changes were complete. As for the new touchscreen, as you've seen, I designed and released a new mount. Assembly is much like the original Prusa design, the new screen being attached by the side brackets, and then the whole lot bolting onto the front of the machine. Let's proceed with the firmware flashing and then the Wi-Fi setup. Assuming our SD card is in place, all we need to do to flash the firmware is to simply turn the board on and wait a few moments. In my case, I knew it had worked because I was reading temperatures for both the bed and the nozzle. We can now power down the printer, remove the SD card and put it back into our computer. We'll see that our firmware file has been renamed to fly.cur, so now we'll proceed to set up the Wi-Fi. For the next portion, we're going to come to our specific board, either the E3 or the E3 Pro, expand the section and go to connecting via Wi-Fi, where our next instructions await. Now we've already done everything so far, including the board.txt file that was set up by the configurator. That brings us to config.g adjustments. Back on our SD card, we're going to open the sys folder, open up config.g, and put a semicolon at the front of the M552 line to temporarily disable the Wi-Fi. We'll now save this file, eject the SD card and put it back in the printer. The printer can be powered up and we need to connect it to our computer via a USB cable. We normally use the free program PuTTY for talking to Raspberry Pis, but once we've set it up following the instructions in the documentation, we can set it to serial mode, retrieve our COM port number from our operating system, match this and set the speed to 115200 before clicking open. It doesn't look like it's alive, but if you enter M503, the firmware will return all of its configuration to you. We'll now copy and paste the instructions from the page, right clicking to insert them into PuTTY before hitting enter. The first command will update the Wi-Fi chip using the binary file we placed on there earlier. When this is done, the next command will disable networking. We'll now enter M587 followed by S with our SSID for our Wi-Fi quoted, followed by P this time with our Wi-Fi password quoted. This will save them to the board. Once this is sent, we can paste in the last command to restart the Wi-Fi. I then retrieved the IP address of the main board, entered it into the browser, and loaded the web interface for the first time. To finish up, we need to come to System, open up config-g, and remove the comment from earlier to make sure the Wi-Fi is automatically enabled every time the printer boots. Click Save to restart the printer, and the Wi-Fi is set up. The next steps involve checking that everything is working as well as some basic calibration. And for me, by far the hardest part of that was getting the sensorless homing working. Our initial aim is to make sure everything is properly configured. So we're gonna turn things on and off to see if the intended behavior occurs. Some items are really simple, such as the part cooling fan, which you should be able to turn on to hear and see running. We'll also do the same for the hot end and the bed, turning them on and monitoring the current temperature as well as the graph to make sure they're rising as expected. To check each axis is moving in the correct direction, we need to home them one at a time. My X axis headed towards minimum as it should, however my Y axis was moving in reverse. To fix any in reverse, we edit config.g. We look up what number the axis is, for me Y being number one, and then we come up to that line P1 and simply flip between a one or a zero to invert the direction. You probably wanna update the comment so it all still makes sense. Save and restart and you're done. We're now going to PID tune the heaters and to help facilitate that, we're gonna create a new file called config-override.g and save it as it is, which is empty. To auto tune the hot end, we simply take the example from the documentation, paste it into our web interface console and update the temperature to suit. I'm tuning for 230 for PETG. You'll notice on the graph, the temperature going up and down and eventually this process will finish telling you the parameter and prompting you to send M500 to save this value to the file we just created. We can now repeat the tuning for the bed, 
changing it from H1 to H0 and changing our temperature to suit. This tuning for the bed works exactly the same as the hot end, it's just going to be much slower, so you have to be patient. But once it ends, once again, we can send M500, and then if we inspect the config override file, we'll see that the PID values have been automatically saved for us. The Prusa Mark III doesn't have any physical end stops, so I could either wire some up, or get the sensorless homing working, which is what I did. It was tricky, so here's what you need to know. Earlier on the configurator, we saw that we needed extra setup and there's a link provided. The trouble is that currently that link goes through to the Duet 3D website and the information provided is for Duet mainboards rather than what we're using. Therefore, I had to combine these instructions with those on the Team Gloomy website. The key thing is that the TMC 2209s must be in Stealth Chop, not Sped Cycle for sensorless homing. The first changes we're gonna make are in config.g. The first change is to our X and Y drives, and we've added D3, which tells the firmware to run them in Stealth Chop, and then I've set V to 120, which means it'll stay in Stealth Chop for moves below 120 millimeters per second. Under end stops, I added M915XY, which turns on stall detection for these axes. S5 is sensitivity, which you can use to tune, with a higher number being less sensitive. The last changes we're gonna make are in Home All, Home X, and Home Y. The code in each is going to have the same pattern. The first thing you'll see is a lot of M400G codes. All they do is let the buffer clear to keep everything in the right order. At the start and end at M913 commands, and what they do is change the stepper motor current. Before the sensorless homing, I drop my X to 20% and my Y to 50%, and when everything's done, they get put back to 100%. The final component is the feed rate of the actual homing moves and we need to make sure that they stay in Stealth Chop. For me, that means keeping them below what I set, which is 7,200 millimeters per minute. We have the exactly the same pattern in Home Y, and again in Home All. The stepper motor current is lowered, the X and Y axes move until they collide, and then the stepper motor current is returned to 100% for printing. Of course, it's possible that you might need to do some tuning. We can see here that the X axis triggers prematurely, we have the option of changing the sensitivity for both axes with M915, or if we need to tweak X or Y by themselves, we can raise or lower the current they're set to before the homing move. To get mine right, I used a combination of these two. That was a bit of a pain, but it is working. And finally, it's time to print something. Regardless of your slicer, the only change you should need to make is sticking the box to use relative extruded distances. Optionally, if your slicer supports it, you can set the G-code flavor to RepRap firmware. Although the vast majority of G-code is compatible between Marlin and RepRap firmware. For my first print, I kept things pretty simple with a 20mm calibration cube. After this turned out okay, I did a little bit of tuning and went for something a little more challenging in the form of this spring clip printed in PETG. That's it, and I'm happy because that's another printer converted to have Wi-Fi. The hardware seems well designed and is well featured, so, so far so good. The LCD interface is not amazing, but still useful. In my opinion, the real hero is the documentation from Team Gloomy. What's in this video combined with that documentation should allow you to install RepRap firmware on any of the compatible boards listed. My ABL setup was easy, so if you want more detail on, for instance, setting up a BL touch with RepRap firmware, or maybe how to set up Pressure Advance, I have videos linked in the description. Let me know in the comments if these FIFA boards tempt you into trying RepRap firmware where you maybe weren't so interested before. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy Wi-Fi connected 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.